Oh, uh, no, my parents both passed away. Yeah. So all, all the stuff you read up until then, or you read up in the past year, is now just like crappy and not worth it. Yeah. Ask your parents what you think of their <coughs> all of their books. Okay. All right, well, sign off. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Sign off. Thank you. Sign off. Thank you. Sign off. Wake, yeah, yeah. Wake, for the sun who scattered into flight, the stars before him. Okay. Drives night along, with thumb from heaven, and strikes the sultan's turret. Kind of like you're the, the guy, right? Like so, use the space. So hands here, plant your feet. Cause you're kind of you're, you're kind of like this. Take take the space. It'll help you. Like, it'll help you. You're good.
Wake, for the sun who scattered into flight, the stars before him from the field of night, drives night along with them from heaven and strikes the sultan's turret with a shaft of light. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on, nor all thy piety, nor wit. Shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. Good morning to everyone in the chapel and to those from watching afar. My name is Hisham Kaleem, and I would first of all like to mention that this speech was on the verge of being canceled. Okay, not for whatever wild reasons you may be thinking of, but it was in fact I who initiated it. On April 13th, at precisely 7.30 p.m., I sent an email to the Rev and Mr. Cambry, explaining that I had developed a slight cough and a bit of a sore throat, and therefore wanted to cancel my speech. When in reality, the two simply masked my anxiety and lack of confidence. Now, I'm still experiencing those symptoms, yet here I am, standing on this podium. So, what had changed in the duration of time between then and now? Let me take you back to Sunday afternoon, just about four weeks ago. On the Sunday of that weekend, I went on a run along Lakeshore Road towards Coronation Park, admiring the scenery and enjoying the light breezes that crossed my path. When just about in the middle of the run, I experienced what psychologists call spontaneous cognition. The instance when a completely random idea enters your mind and without any conscious effort or intentional focus. But this instance, this instance was particularly interesting. Within five minutes, I found myself sitting on a large rock near the oceanfront with nothing but the calculator app open on my phone. Then I crossed my arms and began to think. Okay, there were precisely 334 people excluding me in all of senior school. So, with my calculator in hand, just like so, I input 334. I would say that on any given day, I would have the potential to interact with approximately 15% of the 334 people through classes and extracurriculars, or around 50 people. Now, considering the quantifiable number of interactions I had on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of that week, the probability of me actually interacting with, with these 50 people on any given day was around 30%. There was an 80% probability that those 30% of people would know through Appleby this week that I was presenting at Chapel Speech today. And now, of these last few individuals remaining, a ballpark estimate says there's a 60% chance that they would initiate a conversation with me instead of me doing so in the vice versa situation. Finally, multiplying all of these probabilities together, seven. A grand total of seven people, I was afraid, would come up to me and ask, hey, aren't you supposed to be presenting a chapel speech today? Seven individuals to whom I would awkwardly have to answer why I, of all people, was doing a chapel speech, considering how rarely I speak at all, let alone in public. Seven instances where I would have to worry whether my responses were satisfactory enough for them to retain their perception of me. And I remember looking at this number for the first time and thinking, that's it? Seven did not seem that daunting of a number. So what if I set a margin of error of three people, yielding a total of 10? Still manageable. What if I increased this margin to 10 people? 15, 25, 50? And as I continued adding more and more to this margin, my confidence in myself grew exponentially as I came to the realization that my estimate was ultimately useless in the grand scheme of things. Not knowing that exact number of questions that exact number of situations where I would have to put myself out there all of a sudden did not seem so anxiety inducing because every increment that the margin increased by could be broken down simply into the repetitive addition of one additional person. And to me, dealing with just one more person an indefinite number of times did not seem frightening at all. So here I am. It's a bit counterintuitive since inaccuracy at an estimate is meant to cause distress and it is the inaccuracy itself that alludes to a much greater notion that I believe we as humans perhaps struggle the most to wrap our heads around. No matter the amount of effort we devote, the stress we induce in ourselves in frantic preparation, the endless actions we take, hoping that something good will come out of them, the circumstances of the future do not give any regard to any of it, at all, whatsoever. Alas, it is of the most unfortunate truths. If this is the case, what is the purpose of trying, of thinking, of living, if there's always a non-zero chance that something can go wrong, is it really worth dedicating non-zero effort towards anything? Non-zero thought? Non-zero action? This is something that I have considered many times, 
And I want to address these questions through my own journey with prospection, the act of perceiving the future. When I was younger, I used to live life to the fullest. Every single day after school, I would watch five hours of TV consecutively, not knowing what an electric service bill was. I would break lamps with soccer balls and blame it on my brothers, forgetting that there were security cameras installed right above me. The entire concept of consequences was foreign to me, and never once did concern about my future state cross my mind. Fast forward to the end of middle school, and there immediately came an inflection point that, was I, not, that I was not prepared for. All of a sudden, I was surrounded by ambitious people with a multitude of talents, people who strived for near-perfect grades and carried themselves in a manner much more mature than me. The fun activities and conversations that made school all the more enjoyable seemed to have vanished into thin air and instead were replaced by perpetual stress and anxiety. Being immersed in such an environment, I experienced a significant shift in my motivations inside and outside of school. No longer did I sit in physics class trying to truly understand the brilliance of the principles. Rather, I would occupy myself with memorizing formulas and derivations to maximize my chances of 100 on the next unit test. No longer did I play basketball for the joy of it. Rather, I would strive to be the best on the court, simply to look good for university applications that were to be submitted four years later. It was something I did not want to do, but was compelled to do out of what? Fear. Fear that being myself would not be up to the standards of the people destined in my future. Fear that my life 20 years down the line would be in ruins if I did not invest myself in striving for perfection now. But there is one moment that completely fit my outlook of the unknown that to this day astonishes me. It was the night of September 14th, 2019. I had finished a cup of warm milk and was fast asleep, wanting to get a good amount of rest for school the next day, when suddenly there was a loud banging noise that abruptly woke me up. Assuming that it was simply a strong gust of wind, I fell back to sleep, only to be woken again by my parents in my room, looking out of the window. Startled, I looked up, and all I could see was a piercing bright orange light fluctuating from far away. And then, in one big wave, came the panic. My parents frantically began waking up my siblings, and, with nothing in hand, we took the car out of the garage and began to drive down the main road exiting our city. Given that it was only three in the morning, the sky seemed to be much brighter than usual. So I peered out of the window, and it was at that moment, a moment that I will be sure to never forget, that I saw it. A wall of fire and smoke the size of 50 sky adjacent skyscrapers faced the direction we were driving in, and it seemed to get closer and closer by the second. I suddenly began to tense up. Traffic in front of us began to grow exponentially, and a sense of fear that I had never experienced before overwhelmed me. What if the trees on our sides caught on fire? I anxiously thought to myself. Surely we wouldn't survive, and neither would those beside us. So, crossing the rows of trees, I closed my eyes tight and held on to every bit of hope I had. But within a blink of an eye, we were on the other side, completely unharmed. The same question emerged in my head when we crossed an oil field a kilometer or two from the fire. The smallest of sparks could easily ignite the pipes and destroy everything in our vicinity. Surely if this happened, then we would certainly be in no position to survive. So again, with my eyes closed, we crossed the field. And again, we were unharmed. Then we crossed a large gas station, then a long pipeline. Driving on and on, the fire seemed to be diminishing in size, and at some point, I realized that there was no more foreseeable danger. It was a very peculiar feeling, realizing that my life easily could have ended at any point. Yet there I was, standing with not a single scratch to be seen. In the aftermath of the incident, we learned that there had been a terrorist attack on one of our city's crude oil facilities that caused a 5% drop in the global oil supply. Well, the worries continued. Would there be layoffs to compensate for the supply shock? Were we on the verge of another attack? These questions occupied me for weeks until slowly, with time, they escaped my mind. Because none of it happened. None of the fears that had me on the edge became a reality. And I had ultimately sacrificed my time, energy, and mental capacity for nothing. Now, not everyone will be faced in the situation I was in. But if there is one thing I took away from that experience, it is that life is much, much too short to be dwelling in the past and idealizing the future. We often worry too much about how our past actions altered what our current circumstances could have been and how our current actions could alter what our future circumstances could be. 
that in the process, we lose sense of our present selves. It is a natural human tendency to have hopes and aspirations, but if this tendency is not moderated, the feeling of overconfidence from envisioning the future can become very addictive. A string of successes followed by the smallest of failures could then be devastating because for once, the future did not align with our expectations and a downward spiral of self-doubt ensues. Therefore, I ask all of you to stop, clear your mind of all fears, frustrations, and anxiety, and think. If I were to be the best version of my true self now, what would happen? Would it be more effective for my future or less? Would investing times in things that I truly enjoy rather than those that others expect me to enjoy be more effective in opening doors of opportunity for me or less? Would focusing on self-growth and my understanding of our world instead of striving relentlessly for absolute perfection be more effective in making my future goals a reality or less? In Islam, there is a concept of Qadr which roughly translates to divine decree. And it relates to the poem at the beginning of the speech written by the ancient Arab poet Omar al-Khayyam. It is the belief that God has full knowledge of everything that has happened and will happen, and that everything that occurs in the universe is according to his will and plan. This belief encompasses the idea that every single individual's destiny is predestined by God, but that human beings still have free will to make choices within the parameters set by God. Even if you are not religious, it is still logical to conclude that we as humans cannot s control every single aspect of the future. While we may have one plan, the universe can easily throw us into the complete opposite direction that supersedes our plans. Therefore, it is unreasonable not to expect the unexpected. But once you, you're, once you put your inability con to control the future into the perspective of the universe's control, you attain this tranquility, this peace of mind, knowing that you could have climbed mountains or swam oceans but what was meant to happen for you would ultimately happen. And this tranquility is something that no battle or war could ever achieve. Thank you all so much for listening. And would, would you please rise for hymn number 418, Draw the Circle Wide.